Number one, my neighbor can take off his head. Before I dive into this factual account of recent and past events in my life, I feel like I should make it clear that I do not believe in any other medieval mythological creatures, nor am I even interested in them. I'm just a normal guy and therefore I don't have swords or dragon statues in my house. I don't even read fantasy novels or the Harry Potter books because I'm too busy reading normal things like the sports page and various normal websites like the news sites and ESPN.com. I'm a really normal guy, but I know what I've seen and I've done my research and it all adds up to one undeniable fact. My next door neighbor is a headless man, the medieval humanoid legend that is commonly known as a Blemier. I know how it sounds, but it is true. Bill Hitchcock, who I know is a Blemier, has been my neighbor for about 20 years now. He was my neighbor in my childhood home which I have recently moved back to because my parents retired and moved to Florida so they can constantly be warm which is a priority for them. My mom has been planning for my dad's retirement my entire life so they didn't waste any time signing the house over to me. It was a little weird moving back into the old place, kind of like a weird dream, but I'm not going to look a gift house in the mouth if you know what I mean. What I mean is that I couldn't afford a house on my own, so of course I accepted this gift house, which was offered to me. Many things that I remember from my childhood have changed. Hey, wasn't this door much larger? Hey, wasn't this toilet much larger? And so on. But other things, like my once and current neighbor, Bill Hitchcock, well, they haven't changed a bit. I can clearly remember the day when Bill became our new neighbor. It was during winter break of 2003 and I was in the living room with my friends Bradley and Tipper, whose real middle name was Tippecanoe so we called him Tipper or even Tipper Gore to tease him sometimes. We were trading hockey trading cards to kill time before the big hockey game was playing later on the television. We had the biggest television set, which was simply a fabulous way to view hockey if you couldn't go to the ice rink in person, so we always gathered at my house to watch hockey games. We were in the middle of a difficult multi-hockey card trade when suddenly Tipper perks up and runs to the big window. There was a huge moving truck backing into the driveway. Bradley gasped a little like he just realized something and then said, Maybe some hot girls are moving in and then raised and lowered his eyebrows and blew kisses at us until we told him, Stop doing that! We don't like that! Everyone ran outside to meet the new neighbors, but instead we just met a group of burly male movers who had a lot of boxes to move. I remember thinking that, judging by the number of boxes, it must be a large family and maybe there would be hot girls after all. I was 13 years old, so hot girls were a serious priority. My mom finally got one of the movers' attention by embarrassingly saying, Yoo-hoo! and waving a handkerchief like a damsel in distress, and he came over to the fence where we were just staring. He puts a big box down and says, Your new neighbor ain't here right now. We're putting everything in the house and he's moving in sometime tonight. Just so you know, he was in some sort of accident, so he is basically housebound. You might not see much of him, he seems very private. We'll be leaving the keys under the welcome mat for him. He should know where to get them, but I thought I'd let you know, just in case. Once we were back in the house, we all agreed that this was a perfect opportunity for three naughty boys, which is what we called our prank club, which was heavily inspired by a television show called Punked, starring Ashton Kutcher, in which he would play hilarious pranks on various celebrities and people. We were inspired to create and film pranks of our own, and we even bought matching fedoras to wear while we did so. This was before the days of YouTube, but I think we hoped somehow we would make a career out of being pranksters or something, but mainly we just showed them to our friends at parties. Needless to say, we were always ready for a good prank, and Bradley and Tipper immediately retrieved their fedoras from their backpacks, and I got mine along with the little camera we used to film things. Once we learned about the key to my new neighbor's house under the welcome mat, the three naughty boys were officially open for business. There were two keys under the mat, and they just slid into the locks like a hot fork into a fresh batch of yellow butter. We walked into a house full of boxes, and realized we didn't even have any prank planned. We tried moving the boxes around, but then realized that they probably weren't in any order to begin with. That was when I discovered a box that was labeled HATS. Bradley had the bright idea of taking the hats and putting them on the other boxes so that it would look like all the boxes were wearing hats. It would be funny to film his reaction when he sees all the boxes wearing hats. 
I guess we weren't very good at being pranksters, which is one of probably many reasons why we didn't go pro and get our own show like Ashton. When I ripped the tape off that box labeled HATS and flung the cardboard flaps open, we all gasped and fell backwards onto the floor. Tipper's fedora flew off his head and into the box labeled HATS, which didn't contain any hats until that moment because it was a box full of human heads. Or so we thought. As we crept over to the box and gazed nervously into it, we discovered that they were human heads but that they were all made out of plastic or foam or something. They also had prosthetic rubber shoulder pads attached to them so a person could wear them, especially someone who didn't already have a human head resting on their shoulders. But of course, I didn't know that Bill was a blemier at that point. Bradley suggested that these must be props for movies and that our new neighbor must be a special effects artist or something for movies. Why in the world would someone who works in the movies business move to Minnesota? I asked, but nobody had an answer. Maybe he can help us with prank-related pyrotechnics, Tipper said, ignoring my question. We had always wanted to incorporate explosions into our pranks, but so far we had only melted my dad's homemade birdbath on accident, and then blamed it on the high school varsity baseball team. We wrote a very nice letter to my new neighbor, explaining what the three naughty boys were all about and how we would love it if he could teach us about making props, or how to make better quality videos or whatever. We placed the letter on the kitchen counter, and then put three of the fake heads around it, and then put our fedoras on the heads like they represented us being there, and also it was a great excuse for us to come back soon to retrieve our hats. Or so we thought. The next morning, there were three fedora hats in my backyard that were totally snowed on and maybe chewed on, along with our note which had also been snowed on but was covered with a giant NO that looked like a monster wrote it in red crayon. It was troubling to say the least, but fortunately, we all had received Pacific Sunwear gift certificates for Xmas, aka Christmas, so we were all able to replace the hats. It was still a weird and totally rude move, but we did break and enter into the guy's house, I guess. As we say in the sport of hockey, turnaround is fair play. Naturally, the three naughty boys had to get revenge on this fool who disrespected and ruined their cool hats, so we started looking around my yard for inspiration. Inside my dad's old tool shed, we found our source of inspiration. It was the old family toilet. For some reason, this toilet was so heavy that our upstairs floor started to creak and crack, so it had to be replaced by a toilet that weighed a normal amount. My dad, unwilling to admit that he had purchased a toilet that wasn't regulation weight, had vowed to use this toilet somehow and was even planning to turn it into a new birdbath. It took the strength of all three of us naughty boys to lug that thing into Mr. Hitchcock's front yard. There was snow everywhere so we obviously left a trail of footprints from the toilet in the center of his front yard all the way to my backyard, but that kind of just made it funnier. It really stood out in the white snow because of its seafoam green color, but it needed something. And that something was an old pizza box from the trash. On the grease-stained bottom of the box, Bradley wrote Poop $5, P $1 with a sharpie and propped it up next to the toilet facing the road so it looked like our new neighbor was charging way too much money for the privilege of using the bathroom in his front yard, in public, in the snow. It was hilarious to three naughty 14-year-old boys, but it was still missing something. Of course, we needed to film people reacting to it, otherwise it was just a video of this strange public toilet in the snow with nothing happening to it. We tried filming cars driving by, but nobody seemed to react to it. My dad even drove by on his way home and didn't look or say anything. This one neighbor, Gilbert Eubanks, was walking his dog so Tipper started filming but Gilbert Eubanks was clearly more focused on his dumb tiny dog and not looking over at the hilarious toilet so I had to yell, Hey Gil, look! And then he was looking over at the three of us just standing behind the fence with a camera and was like, What? What am I looking at? And then I pointed over to the toilet and he looked and then said, Oh, I see. Very funny boys. In this voice like he wasn't impressed at all. It just looked confusing on the video and you can barely hear him. That's when we decided that it would be super funny to alert Mr. Hitchcock to this hilarious thing in his yard and see him come out and react to it and be super confused and have to deal with this weird problem. We decided upon a classic routine of Ding Dong's Dash, whereby one naughty boy rings another person's doorbell and then runs behind a fence or perhaps some bushes or shrubs and films it for his prank club. It is usually super funny under normal circumstances to say the least so the toilet for rent in the yard should have really elevated it to new heights. Or so we thought. It was starting to get dark by that point, so Bradley felt emboldened when he walked up to Mr. Hitchcock's door. 
The porch light provided a perfect amount of light to capture our misdeeds. In the video, you can clearly see Bradley walking up, wearing his trucker cap and sunglasses even though it is the evening. Then he rings the doorbell a bunch of times and hauls ass to the back of the house so he can make a clean escape over the fence. The door cracks open just a tiny bit, and it is obvious that whoever is inside is looking at the toilet, but still, we were hoping for a reaction shot so we're just filming the door for like 30 seconds, and then the porch light is turned off. There's a little light from the street and from my house, but you really can't see much on the video from this point, which is unfortunate, because this is when things get really nuts. Mr. Hitchcock comes out fast. It is very dark, but he is clearly very wide and tall. Not like he's overweight or something, he's un just unusually wide and wearing an oversized trench coat or something. He goes straight for the toilet and lifts it, and when he does, we look at each other because we can't believe this feat of strength, but then he grunts and it is so loud it echoes down the street. He takes a step and then realizes just how deceptively heavy this toilet is, props it up on his knee to get a better grip, lifts it even higher, which is a mistake, and then falls backward into the snow. The world's heaviest toilet is embedded in the snow right where Mr. Hitchcock's head just was. We only have time to look at one another and say some curse words when the body starts convulsing and I was thinking, oh god, this is horrible. Our prank killed a guy in the worst possible way to die. But then something happened. His arms swung back, gripped the toilet, and toppled it to one side. Then he stood up. It was hard to tell in the dark, but it was clear that he didn't have a head anymore. It kind of looked like it was bent backwards so that it came up out of his back or something. The headless body just stood there for a second, and then picked up the toilet and walked over to the sidewalk and threw it on the curb. Then Mr. Hitchcock ran back into his house and slammed the door behind him. We waited for an ambulance to arrive or something, but that didn't even make sense because we had all seen that his head was clearly smashed into the ground. There was no recovering from an injury like that. Then we saw lights going on upstairs in Mr. Hitchcock's house. A very wide shadow was walking about in a room upstairs. He seemed fine, not screaming or dying or anything. We waited until it was very late to go back outside and return the toilet to my dad's shed. Tip and Bradley stayed the night so we could debate whether or not we were going to jail forever. Then we realized that the only crime we might have committed was accidental murder by prank. But Bill Hitchcock was still alive, clearly. Bradley was the most cowardly of all, so he stayed in my room all night playing Tony Hawk 4 like a baby. Me and Tipper went outside to investigate the potential crime scene. We took little flashlights with us and walked around the block, and our story, if anyone asked us, was that we were looking for our wallets which we dropped in some snow. After making sure that there was no movement in Bill Hitchcock's house, we ran over to the toilet-shaped crater in the center of his yard. There was dirt mixed in with the snow but no blood or anything. That was good. But after digging for a few seconds with my frozen little fingers, I uncovered something very interesting. A small plastic eyeball that would have looked very realistic if it wasn't so squashed. We ran back to my house, where Bradley was waiting for us at the front door. He looked spooked. Before we could share our strange discovery with him, he said, I saw him. I saw Mr. Hitchcock. He was watching you guys from the side window that is across from your bedroom. I had turned the lights off, so I guess he thought it was safe. I saw him open the window, and then when he stuck his body out, I could see his outline pretty clearly. Guys, he doesn't have a head. It was just shoulders and no neck or anything. I'm not even sure how he was watching you, but he was. I was just staring wide-eyed at Bradley as he said this, like he was the mouth of a gift house. Well, I have one of his eyeballs, I said, holding up the smushed little orb. Everything added up to this dude having no head, but was that even possible? We all agreed that we sounded like crazy people, and that the three naughty boys must capture my headless neighbor on film, or otherwise nobody would ever believe us. We tried to get Bradley to draw a picture of what he saw with some crayons, but his drawing skills turned out to be terrible, and it just looked like the little man on the bathroom sign, but without the circle that represents the head. It wasn't super helpful, but I hung it up on my wall anyway, as a reminder of what our ultimate goal was, to catch a monster living right next door. Also, I think we hung it up to shame Bradley for being such a bad drawer. Bill Hitchcock got his mail delivered through a little flap at the door, and also got groceries delivered to his porch, so there were not many opportunities to catch him outside. Though I was always ready. I angled one of our motion-detecting lights toward his front porch, and ran to my window at all times of the night, only to be disappointed because it was a possum or something. Possums scare me a whole bunch as well, so I didn't care much for seeing them around my house. Those possums did remind me of the garbage cans that I had to put out front every Thursday night, however, and I was pretty sure Bill had to do the same. His rolly garbage container was always out there on Friday morning, and then put back to the side of his house on Saturday morning. I kept setting an alarm for later and later, until I narrowed the time down to between 4 and 5 a.m. 
That was when he was putting out his dirty old trash can, and that was when I was going to sneak outside and videotape him. Thursday night is famously a school night, so I had to do this mission solo. I set my alarm clock for 4 a.m. and tried to get some sleep. I slept in my darkest clothes with my camera next to me so that when that alarm went off, I just grabbed it and hustled downstairs and out the door. I crouched behind the little fence separating our yards and waited in the cold, cold darkness, jumping at every rustle of the blades of grass in the wind because I thought the possums were going to get me. It occurred to me then that perhaps it was the glowing red eyes and sharp teeth of a possum in the dark that had inspired so many vampire legends and sightings throughout history. So, I was scared and it was so dang dark, but there was the light from the street and the light from when Bill Hitchcock's porch light popped on. He came out, got his trash can and wheeled it to the curb and went back in the house. And I got the whole thing on video. There was just one little problem though. That one little problem is that everyone, and I mean everyone, who saw that video did a little squint with their eyes and then said, that's obviously you in the video. Tipper said that, Bradley said that, even other friends I haven't mentioned said that. My first response was, no way, I'm not that big, look at that guy, he's huge. Bradley said it looked like I just stuffed a bunch of pillows under my shirt. Tipper said I was just getting fat because he's a seriously rude guy. We put the video into pause mode and scrutinized every frame trying to find the one that best captured Bill's face, which obviously wasn't my face. But I did have to admit, there were eerie similarities. The nose and forehead looked like mine, and the slicked back raven black hair, which was my trademark in those days, also looked like mine. But then we got to the point where he was coming around the side of the house to get the garbage can, and I paused it again. What at first we had mistaken for a reflection of the light, and perhaps came and went too quickly for the naked eye, now became more clear. Uh, I don't have tiny flashlights for eyeballs, guys, sorry, I said to the other naughty boys cramming their faces closer to the screen to get a good look. That's right, the eyes were clearly projecting a faint light from them. We all agreed that what had most likely happened was that my neighbor, who we all agreed was wearing fake human heads upon his shoulders because he did not have a head of his own, had modeled a new head that looked exactly like mine. We spent a lot of time talking about why he would do this, and decided that it kind of made sense because if someone saw him at night in our neighborhood, they would just assume it was that handsome kid who was always pulling really funny pranks and stunts, and not think twice about it. It was around this time that Bradley became totally obsessed with the idea of filling Bill Hitchcock's house full of bees. He thought that this would either cause Bill to run out of the house in broad daylight, or else exterminators would have to come into his house, and then they would be like, Yo, this dude doesn't even have a head! We were like, Bradley, we don't live inside a funny cartoon. You can't just throw a beehive through an open window. He never opens his windows anyway. And also, where are you going to just get a beehive? I mean, there were lots of reasons why it was a terrible plan. He wanted to collect the bees in a jar or something and then spit them through a straw into the little mail flap on the door. We told him it was a stupid idea and we weren't going to do that, but he apparently climbed some tree out in the forest anyway, trying to catch bees in a little jar he brought with him. Basically, he fell out of a tree and got stung by a whole bunch of bees and was not found for like six hours, and was just fighting off bees with his one good arm, and so his body was kind of messed up, and he couldn't swim anymore, so he had to quit the swim team, and for some reason, me and Tipper got blamed because everybody thought it was a three naughty boys prank, and then I had to go away to military school. Needless to say, it is a little surreal being back in the old house after 18 years. I never joined a professional hockey team or got my own prank show, but I am older and wiser and have the ability to Google almost anything. That's how I learned that, of course, there is no record of the man Bill Hitchcock living next to me. The house is owned by some weird sounding generic company called Forge Stunts Co. One thing that did come up a bunch in my online searches was the classic horror movie called Final Destination, which features a character named Billy Hitchcock who gets decapitated by shrapnel in the movie. I believe that would be a very suitable namesake for someone who doesn't actually have a head. In addition to having Googling powers, I also have access to new and improved technology that I can purchase with my adult credit card. I can buy things like a state-of-the-art drone that is capable of projecting live video to my phone and is real silent even when it is right outside a neighbor's window. It took a few months of recording because he always does such a great job at closing his curtains, but I got it. I actually wish I hadn't, but I have video proof that Mr. Hitchcock isn't human. I was navigating the drone expertly from window to window last night which was my routine, and then suddenly, a sliver of light shone through in the upstairs window in the backyard. There was some green wallpaper and a bed and a chair at the end of the bed. I was like, man, this is framed so well it looks like a movie or something, before it occurred to me that this was staged. It was intentional. Then a large figure comes into view, standing in front of the bed. 
It's Bill Hitchcock, and I know this even though I can really only see a large torso covered in a black robe. He stands there like that for a minute, and then sits on the bed so I can see his face. It's me. Or, I should say, it is my head. The head from when I filmed him taking out the garbage so many years ago. In the light, though, it's not going to fool anyone. It looks like a kid made it or something. It looks like a melted teenage Dracula head. Very slowly, it reaches up and pulls the head off, and then places it on the chair. The hands hesitate for a moment, and then open the black robe up and let it fall to the floor. At first my brain cannot process what I am seeing, and I believe I am looking at hyper-realistic tattoos of a giant face. But then the eyes open. They are right where nipples should be, and the size of softballs. The nose is long and flat, and points to the enormous mouth, which looks like a long gash along the stomach. It opens too wide, revealing its bizarre giant molars which remind me of a cartoon hippopotamus, and at that point I realize I'm having trouble holding my phone steady because I'm shaking with fear. He picks up the fake head of teenage me, and looks like he's trying to crush it with both hands, but then suddenly he throws it toward the drone like he's passing a basketball. I guess the window was open and I just didn't notice. The drone was completely destroyed. I can see it from my window in his yard, but for some reason the fake head is nowhere to be seen. I have been reading about the legends of the Blemier on the World Wide Web for the past few hours. There isn't a lot of very clear information or even modern stories about them like there are with vampires or skinwalkers. There are many different theories regarding how their facial features are arranged on the torso. However, there is one unique characteristic of the Blemier that many sources tend to agree on, that they are all enthusiastic cannibals who love nothing more than to dine on human flesh. If you suspect someone in your life to be a Blemier because you have seen them remove their head, or if their head just doesn't seem totally real, please get in touch with me through this website. I know Bill can't be the only one out there. Don't forget to subscribe, and remember, true pastas are the scariest pastas. <laughs>